Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 13, verses 17 to 22. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was nearer. For God thought if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness bordering the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of the land of Egypt, prepared for battle. And Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had required a solemn oath of the Israelites, saying, God will surely come to you, and then you must carry my bones with you from here. They set out from Sukkoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light so that they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Do you ever go through seasons of life where you pause when someone just casually asks, how are you doing? And in that pause, you seriously consider telling the truth. You think, maybe I'll be really honest and have a real human connection in this moment. I'll drop the facade and I'll be vulnerable and maybe this other person will be able to hold space for me and my heart if I say something like, I'm exhausted, I'm disillusioned, I'm bitter, I'm barely holding it all together. I have serious doubts about my faith, and I'm struggling to find hope and purpose in my life. But instead, you look the 17-year-old Starbucks barista in the eyes, (laughs) and you say, I'm fine. Grande vanilla latte, please. I call this a mercy lie because we all know the barista doesn't want to hear about our problems. They're not our therapist. They're not even our friend. And there's already someone in line behind us waiting to order. It seems like a lot of people I know are going through this type of mercy lie to the Starbucks barista season of life right now. I know a lot of us are going through difficult things like health stuff and family stuff, relationship stuff, Job stuff, house stuff, car stuff, kid stuff, or a combination of all those things. I know a lot of us are going through these things because of my nature, of my role in this community, but I also know there are a lot of you who hold your pain inside. You don't share it openly, and you remain private about your troubles. Some of us are just going through some deep existential stuff right now that doesn't even fall into a specific category, but it's got us feeling down And some of these seasons drag on for weeks and months, even years. It seems like the longer they go on, the harder it is to believe that something better is coming. The Hebrew people had been enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years. That's a really long time. That's twice as long as our country has existed. And I have to assume at some point in those 400 years, a whole generation of Hebrews shifted from feeling like they were in just a rough season of life to thinking that slavery was normal. After a few decades, it was all they knew. And I'm sure they came up with all types of coping mechanisms, some healthier than others, like we all do. But the most dangerous coping mechanism is believing that enslavement is not only normal, but that it's inevitable, normalizing the enslavement feeling. Thankfully, God is not interested in keeping anyone enslaved. God is not interested in helping us simply cope with seasons of hardship. God is interested in freeing us. So God sends Moses to badger Pharaoh until he agrees to let the Hebrews go. And as Moses is leading the people out of Egypt, scripture tells us that there were two different routes that could be taken to get out of Egypt and to the promised land. The main road was called the Way of the Philistines. And it was a highway that ran along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It was a heavily traded route. So we have to assume there was lots of water, lots of rest stops and merchants, a lot of good five-star hotels and, you know, bistros along the way. But God chose to lead the people south, the scripture tells us, by the, quote, roundabout way of the wilderness, 
where there were no roads, there were no bridges, there was no water, there was no food. And on this way, all anyone could see was the shimmering Red Sea and then a huge expanse of dry desert. And we have to wonder, why does God always take God's people on the hard roundabout way? Why doesn't God ever choose to lead us across Easy Street, that big highway to success? I've come to believe that the reason is because this journey, the whole purpose of this journey and the purpose of our lives is to learn to walk with God into freedom. And we never learn how to do that by taking the way of the Philistines. The way of the Philistines is littered with billboards that will tell you all you need to do is to buy something else, find a new relationship, start a new self-improvement regiment, move to another city, get a new job or a promotion. The way of the Philistines will offer a well-worn path to success and happiness. And if that one doesn't work, they'll put you on another diversion. The way of the Philistines will tell you that this is the best way. It's the only way to achieve your goals and your dreams, and it, it will get you there quickly. But think about the times that you have tried to walk the way of the Philistines in the past. Has any of that ever really led to lasting freedom? No, because lasting freedom doesn't come from rearranging the external aspects of our lives. We can change the external circumstances. We can change our environment. We can change our work. But if we aren't doing any internal work, any emotional and spiritual work, nothing about our lives will ever truly change. We will remain enslaved to whatever dysfunction or trauma or addiction or cycle that has a grip on our hearts. No, freedom is not found easily by taking a highway to happiness. Freedom is won from the inside out, and there is simply no quick way to do that. It happens in the hard, dry desert where we feel lost, and we have more questions than answers, and we aren't sure of anything anymore. It is here in this desert where we learn to let go of our fears in order to cling to the God who it turns out is always with us. This is our last sermon in the series, Indescribable Images of God. And in this passage, scripture says God appeared to the Hebrews during this journey as a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire during the night so that they could keep moving, they could keep walking, keep journeying, day and night as they moved away from slavery and they moved towards freedom one uncertain but hopeful step at a time. Now it took the Hebrew people 40 years of wandering in the desert to reach the promised land. So I told you this path is not short and it is not easy. The thing about the journey to freedom for the Israelites, the Hebrew people, is that they didn't choose it. Maybe in the beginning of their enslavement, they maybe tried to escape. Maybe they hatched a hundred failed plans, but eventually they had given up. They had accepted slavery in Egypt as their fate forever, and as their children's fate, and as their grandchildren's fate, and as their grandchildren's grandchildren's fate. In other words, they had completely given up hope. They weren't looking or dreaming about freedom anymore at all. It's when God steps in and decides for them Enough is enough. I'm getting you out of here. When God appears to Moses as a burning bush, and by the way, that event also happened when Moses was feeling lost and hopeless, God comes to Moses in this burning bush and informs him that he will be taking part in God's great journey to freedom. And by taking part, we mean he's going to be leading it. And similarly, God didn't consult Moses. God didn't consult the Hebrews about this plan. God just decided it's time and sends Moses to warn Pharaoh of what would be coming until he frees his Hebrew slaves. The water will turn to blood. There will be frogs, lice. Your livestock will die. There will be boils on everyone's bodies, hail, locusts, complete darkness, and finally, the most unspeakable plague of all, all of the Egyptian firstborn children will perish. Sometimes, the journey to freedom has really ugly, painful, heartbreaking beginnings. 
I know those among us who are grieving loved ones right now or braving the way through chronic illness or chemotherapy or radiation or struggling with disordered eating or alcohol dependency may feel like you are in a deep, heavy trench right now and it's exhausting trying to claw your way out every day. And so I just want to speak this word of hope to you today. I believe that God has already begun your journey to freedom in the midst of your hopelessness. God has already mapped out the route. And while it's not a simple highway to happiness, and it may take far longer than you believe you can continue, she will be with you every step of the way. This is the promise of the gospel. This is the promise of our faith. We talk about, we have this beautiful hymn about how the life of a seed, the life of a flower begins in the, in the seed, in the bulb, in the darkness, in the soil. This is the story of resurrection. New life begins in the tomb, in the darkness, in the midst of hopelessness. And so like a cloud during the day and a fire at night, God will be there to guide you, to gently remind you of her presence, and to lead you forward one small step at a time until you realize one day you're not in Egypt anymore. And then eventually Egypt will become a distant memory. And then you'll begin to maybe dream about the promised land and believe that it might even be within walking distance after all. And one day, one day you'll realize you're free. And you've learned to trust God because you realize she never left you alone all those many months in the desert. Now I realize that those images of fire and cloud are kind of vague images for God. And vague is one of our society's least favorite adjectives. If you've ever given a report or a presentation at work, you don't want the feedback that it was kind of vague. When you ask your teenager where they're going as they cruise out the door, you don't want them to be vague. And when your daughter announces she's engaged and she's going to be married and you ask about her future with her new intended to be, you don't want their plans to be vague. Vague irritates us. Vague scares us. It worries us. We like concrete plans, well thought out strategies. Projected numbers are good and an abundance of details. The more we know, the more in control we feel. But when we step back and think about it, none of our concrete plans have been that effective in maintaining control. Chances are most of us have experienced interruptions in our lives that have led us to where we are today. We didn't get the job we wanted. We had to switch careers, we had to move, we had to take care of an ill family member, we had to sacrifice for our children. We fell in love, or we fell out of love, or we never fell in love at all, although we had definitely planned on doing that. And here we are, whether our plans were concrete or vague, we have ended up right here where we are today, being asked to trust God in all her mystery, and sometimes her vagueness, to lead us to freedom. Where are the Hebrews going exactly? They don't know. A vague promised land. How will they survive? No idea. Apparently, this bread stuff called manna appears every morning, just enough for that day's nourishment. No more, no less. It doesn't even have a name. The word manna, translated in Hebrew, is what is it? Very vague. <laughs> How long will they be in the desert? Longer than they'd like. Why should they keep going? Well, they don't have a choice. And neither do we. Because the journey to freedom has already begun. God has decided it is time. God has decided that we have a future ahead of us. And she's the only one who can guide us there. So now... It is our job to keep moving, one hopeful step at a time, day and night, night and day. Amen.